Okay, so um, our next session is titled Ecology and Sustainability. And um, it's impossible and indeed short-sighted to conceive of this current pandemic without recognizing the role that climate change has played in affecting the frequency and severity of epidemics and how the same technologies of mass movement and consumption that contribute to environmental pollution and climate change also render us vulnerable to epidemic illness and make its effects more severe. In this session, we use the term ecology in a deliberately broad sense, referring not only to the natural and human-made systems that have contributed to and been affected by COVID, but also to the broader social and cultural prisms through which we can see, understand, and respond to COVID-19. Communities, for example, are one such ecological niche. Indeed, communities are both a source of infection and resilience, intervention and antidote. More broadly, papers in this session will explore the direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19 on urban and natural environments, sustainability, and environmental justice. We will hear case studies from about social and ecological sustainability efforts in community schools and US contexts, as well as ecosystemic landscape interventions in Italy. Papers will also articulate the impacts of climate change and global warming on the susceptibility of urban and rural communities to infectious illness, showcase human and built uh, responses to the impacts of these ecological issues, including thermally comfortable sidewalks in Argentina and socially resilient housing typologies in Rwanda. In some papers will explore socio-ecological socio relationships broadly defined in the ways they have shaped and been shaped by COVID responses. Moderating today's session is Dr. Michael G. Van. Dr. Van is professor of history at California State University, Sacramento. His research on the French colonial empire and the history of Southeast Asia during the Cold War has been published in several books and over two dozen academic journal articles. His most recent book is The Great Hanoi Rat Hunt, Empire, Disease and Modernity in French Colonial Vietnam, published by Oxford University Press in 2019. Dr. Van's current research compares the representation of Cold War era mass violence in Vietnamese, Cambodian and Indonesian museums. Okay, thank you, uh, Caitlin and Mohammed, uh, for putting together this great symposium, and thank you to all the attendees around the world. Um, this session on ecology and sustainability has four papers from four continents, reflecting the truly global nature of this event. Our first paper is from Andrea Oldani. It is entitled Landscape and Ecosystem Intensification Strategies During and After Pandemics in Milan, Italy. Dr. Oldani is an assistant professor of landscape architecture in the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies at Politecnico di Milano, where he's a faculty member of the School of Architecture, Planning, and Construction Engineering. He earned a PhD in Architectural and Urban Design from the Department of Architecture and Planning. His uh, research on the landscape of contemporary infrastructure has been published in a number of scientific journals. The recent past has been marked by ecological criticalities and environmental urgencies that the COVID-19 pandemic had in some ways the merit of pulling out even more strongly. One of these issues is the weakness and fragility of dense, congested and polluted areas deeply rooted in pandemics dynamics. The case that I bring to the conference attention is related to Milan in northern Italy. In this context, it is evident the problem of air pollution and the high density. These two conditions have negatively influenced the spread and severity of COVID-19 since the pandemic's first phase. It must be remarked that people debilitated by continuous contact with air pollutants are more prone to severe pulmonary consequences due to viral and bacterial diseases. The maps presented show a precise correspondence between places and pandemic phenomena, offering several insights for those involved in urban architectural and landscape design. It appears clear how these criticalities involve landscape architecture as a discipline capable of reading existing conditions, highlighting figures, dynamics, pros and cons, and defining the strategical points around which gather a variety of expertise for an interdisciplinary strategical project. In this scenario, a sort of design hope lies in the possibility of redeeming an uncertain present for a more livable future, more resilient also to pandemics. 
the 38 kilometer axis of the northwest drainage canal running from the dense diffuse periphery at the north of Milan to the Ticino River on the west side results in the meantime as a cutting and a connection in the mosaic of residual open spaces in the metropolitan conurbation including agricultural parks and some relevant natural areas. The research assumes the controversy and ambiguity of this forgotten line as an opportunity in a vast and complex mosaic whose recycling is fundamental for the future of the environment, the safeness and the possibility of inhabiting these areas. Under those circumstances, it's essential to build a framework of knowledge and visions capable of offering new perspective on this line and the systems that it crosses. The goal is to imagine how an artifact without any architectural value and a contested infrastructure that is also a vehicle for heavy forms of pollution can be redeemed through a project capable of making it the backbone of a landscape of diversity. This can happen through a series of actions capable of changing the image and the overall sense of this infrastructure. The study of the landscape in its complexity and variety allows a summary of the dominant components. These fields become the physical and problematic contexts within which developing visions and forms of the invention. It is evident the coexistence of values like reserves and fragments of diversity, blue-green networks and weaknesses like grounds of urban dispersion, grids and nodes of the diffused metropolis. That character coexists together with agricultural productive spaces, characterized by a controversial role because their ecological dimension is not meaningful as commonly perceived. The brief analysis allows the first draft of strategies for a more resilient ecosystem oriented to diversity intensification, environmental reparation and innovation. Some primary actions like the care and completion of the Green Corridor, as well as the intensification of the reserves of diversity, can be combined with attempts to compensate the loss of some agricultural land in favor of natural diversity through new forms of controlled or innovative productions. For example, vertical farming. Those strategies answer in different ways to the existing conditions, balancing the role of wide open spaces, dense or less dense urban contexts. In this sense, a common and necessary goal is to eliminate bounds between urban spaces and the canal, thinking to its inclusion in innovative types of public spaces, including plural infrastructures and some new architectural shapes for the collection and management of groundwater, wastewater and rainwater. I think this brief presentation is enough to highlight how the existing condition of urban and natural environments impact the effects of pandemic like COVID-19. The intent has been showing how some complex and forgotten infrastructure can assume a fundamental role in reassessing metropolitan areas' susceptibility to the spread of infectious illness. It emerges a vision for a challenging program on the landscape. Some traditional growth mechanisms could change, considering the preeminence of essential ecosystem services that can result from a careful landscape design, somehow suggested by the pandemic's severe effects and dynamics. Let us remember that pandemic's frequencies also depends on the quality and honesty with which humanities mm. relates to the environment. Our next session, uh, our next paper is from the United States. The team is composed of Rebecca Milne, Sean O'Donnell, and Bruce Levine. The title is Communities, Schools, and Future Ecologies in Washington, DC. Rebecca Milne is Director of Design Strategy at Perkins Eastman. Rebecca is a graduate of McGill University with bachelor's degrees, plural, 
in psychology with an emphasis on neuropsychology and art history. She received her master's in interior design from the Pratt Institute and a master of architecture from Boston Architectural College. As a published researcher, Rebecca has pioneered several studies examining collaboration and individualization in workplace, healthcare, and education environments. Sean O'Donnell is the practice area leader for Perkins Eastman's International K-12 Practice and the co-director of the Consortium for Design and Education Outcomes, a research partnership with Drexel University's School of Education. Sean received his Master of Architecture from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He is deeply committed to sustainable school design and has served as a juror for numerous school design competitions, authored articles and presented internationally, and his projects have won more than 30 awards. And Bruce Levine is Associate Clinical Professor of Education Policy at Drexel University's School of Education and Director of the Education Policy Program at that school. He obtained his JD from New York University. His scholarship encompasses issues of equity and access in American education, including development of community school models and the relationship of school design to education and community outcomes. With the COVID-19 pandemic still having tragic consequences for our societies and dramatic implications for our schools, we've become acutely aware of the value of the educational environment, not only to individuals, but to the sustainability and the ecosystem of our communities. Recognizing the knowledge required to develop appropriate environmental design responses and the complexity, we've assembled an interdisciplinary team of architects and academic researchers from Perkins Eastman and Drexel University. And together we've spent the last nine months exploring these emerging ideas and continue to do so. The first thing we've recognized is that it's not one crisis, not just COVID, that we need to address. There are at least four parallel crises occurring to health and well being for sure, but also economic recession, the movements for social justice, most prominently Black Lives Matter, and overarching global warming and sustainability concerns. These four crises are occurring simultaneously, causing immense stress to societal systems that we rely upon. Rather than simply dealing with only one of these complex issues at a time, we're faced with a pandemic that has caused existing economic, social, and environmental concerns to heighten, requiring multidisciplinary and multifaceted responses. COVID and the, and the parallel crises has really disrupted every aspect of the way we work and live. Education in particular has experienced profound disruption. To help navigate these changes, we've engaged in research both independently and in collaboration with schools, parents, and teachers and educators, investigating the impact not just on COVID-19 on educational institutions, but on students, families, and communities, which are all linked. Our methods include an online survey for parents and students, roundtable discussions with academic clients, and ongoing research to identify trends, challenges, and opportunities for the future of education design. The findings of our research really underscore the interconnectedness of the public education system with social, environmental, economic, and public health factors. Not surprisingly, we found that the impact of the switch from in-person to remote learning to be significant on both students and parents. Beyond the obvious issue of learning loss, with around 60% of students learning less than usual, we also found to have profound effects on our social emotional well-being. Social development is not easily transferred to virtual settings, particularly for younger children. Schools are not just a source for education, but they provide valuable resources and services for families like childcare, nutritious meals, mental health services, and more. Most students have noted that they feel more stressed and isolated from friends since stay at home orders. And they also feel less confident in their ability to learn from home. Um, they feel a lot lonelier, 34% feeling lonelier, and 88% of parents have also identifying that feeling isolated from their friends has really impacted their child's learning experience at home. We think that without the support services typically provided by schools, children are more vulnerable to stress um, and learning loss. 
Our key takeaways from our research can be summarized as the following. Remote learning doesn't necessarily replace classroom learning. The classroom is so essential to learning that we really feel that it's really important for us to address this as we look to future models. Socialization is crucial to education. We really learn a lot from being with our peers, teachers, and mentors, and that's also really important to both the social and emotional development and to our learning outcomes as well. With everything we're seeing, we're also uh, predicting that learning models will be shifting with all the complex balance of demands that we're seeing. It will be interesting to see how it plays out in the months and years to come. And most importantly, schools are at the heart of our community. In times of crisis, communities turn to schools for support, hope and shelter and sustenance. Schools really provide essential resources to the community at large, but especially to students, many of whom don't have these resources available to them in other forms. Due to the changes brought on by COVID-19 in our educational system, educational delivery has changed and evolved, and schools will need to address these changes, which in turn will positively impact our communities. Among the factors inspiring change in school design include emphasizing indoor environmental quality factors and their impact on educational outcomes, health, and wellness accelerating the implementation of one-to-one -one educational technology and associated applications, increasing blended learning within a hybrid educational model, making education more accessible to all learners, expanding synchronous and asynchronous blended learning pedagogies, and increasing interest in community schools, expanding services and resources provided to students, families, and the community. Many of these issues existed either as mainstream or emerging ideas prior to the COVID crisis, but now there's an increased urgency to act. Challenges in reopening schools, particularly in under-resourced urban areas, has underscored the need to provide equitable facilities across all of our communities. And understanding that this crisis is tied directly to climate change bolsters the need to dramatically reduce the impact on our, of our buildings on the environment. With virtually everyone sensitized to the influence of school infrastructure now on not only the health and wellness of our students and teachers, but on the community as a whole, we need to create schools that dramatically enhance wellness as well. Just as many of these ideas existed before the crisis, there are already some models of this next generation school emerging. One example is West Elementary School, illustrated here. Currently under construction, it's targeted to become the first net zero energy and well certified school in the world. This combination means that its design and building systems not only conserve resources, in this case, the building generated more energy than it consumes, but that its sustainable design also has directly targeted creating a healthy, high performance place to learn. Indoor environmental quality factors, ranging from daylight, enhanced acoustics, thermal comfort, to indoor air quality can enhance learning outcomes. And considering COVID, enhanced ventilation not only improves cognitive function, but it also has a positive influence on health and well-being. Another conclusion arising from our research during the pandemic is that wellness should not only focus on the inv individual as it has traditionally. As creatures living within a complex, interconnected, local and global ecosystem, we need to focus on the wellness and resilience of our communities and the environments and places that we reside within. This leads us to consider the expansion of the school's role as a central resource and a more holistic approach to wellness to truly become community schools. Education researchers have begun to document the beneficial impacts of community school models, which with appropriate funding and policy support can sustainably provide integrated student supports and wraparound services. The community schools approach consists both of creating a particular kind of place and a set of partnerships. To date, most of the places have been essentially retrofitted into school buildings that were originally built as a traditional collection of classrooms, hallways, offices, and a few gathering spots. Moving forward, we need to envision and construct flexible physical spaces that can support health and social services and youth and community development activities, among other things, and that are open beyond eight to three on weekdays. They also must accommodate the community partnerships that are not only focused on academic achievement, but on meeting community needs, which can range from food distribution to civic activities like voting and candidate forums. In other words, serving as a hub in the ecosystem of a community.
our next for our next paper, we'll be leaving the winter of the northern hemisphere and going to the summer of the southern hemisphere. This is relevant as the this paper is entitled "Urban Form and Thermally Comfortable Streetscapes in Post-COVID Mendoza, Argentina." We have a team of three presenters from Argentina on this paper. The speaker will be Maria Belen Sosa, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Institute of Environment, Habitat and Energy in Mendoza, Argentina. She obtained her PhD in science at Universidad Nacional de Salta, Argentina. She has published about the relationship between urban form and outdoor thermal conditions with a focus on bioclimatic urbanism. She, on this project, she was joined by Erika Correra, a chemical engineer with a PhD in science and renewable energy, who is a researcher and professor at National Technological University in Argentina, and Maria Alicia Canton, an architect with a DAE in architecture and univer university professor in Mendoza University and researcher in Argentina. Hi everyone, I am presenting our work from Argentina. Early research on the impacts of COVID on cities is mainly related to four things environment and quality, socioeconomic impacts, management and governance, and transportation and urban design. Our work at the Institute of Environment, Habitat and Energy in Mendoza, Argentina, has been focused on urban form design, as we consider it a powerful tool to achieve more legal communities in the post-COVID age. Particularly in arid zones, where the extreme weather conditions in summer decrease the use of our spaces. The Mendoza metropolitan area is located in an arid zone west of Argentina. The image of the bottom shows the location of Mendoza in the South American continent. Besides the forested streets, Mendoza is uncomfortable during summertime. Around warming affects the outdoor and indoor thermal condition, decreasing the use of outdoor spaces and increasing the use of energy consumption. Our methodology consists in developing 48 urban design scenarios and neighborhood scale. We tested 24 basic scenarios and 24 optimized scenarios that combine three strategies to reduce this urban warming. That are the design of the urban form layout of the neighborhoods, the trees, and the material salvages. We use um, three main procedures to predict the results of these different scenarios. First one, we uh, select the neighborhood where the macroclimatic monitoring campaign were made. With this data, we adjust simulations made uh, by using MBMET software. Our final research shows that the urban warming strategy used improves the outdoor thermal conditions by decreasing 4.7 Celsius degrees the maximum air temperatures, 2.5 the minimum, and 3.4 the average air temperature. The thermal behavior graphic shows in gray lines the base cases and the light blue lines the optimized cases. It can be noticed that the strategy used contributes to reduce this um, urban warming effects and uh, decrease the outdoor air temperatures. Our design recommendations for achieve cooler communities are um, design neighborhood grids that uh, contribute to decreases outdoor air temperature. Rectangular design show us this is better. Uh, regarding the street orientation for the south hemisphere, northwest and northwest southeast orientations are uh, the best. Uh, the street trees, we recommend second magnitude trees in blind pits each six meters. And the material salvados, cool materials uh, in all exposed surfaces, particularly in horizontal ones. Uh, our concluding thoughts for this post COVID age are that the pandemic forces us to reassess the way we design and think our city, rethinking the relationship between urban design and public health. By reducing air, outdoor air temperatures, street, street tapes became more livable. This condition helped increase the walkability and reduce the car and the public transportation dependency 
conditions that contribute to decrease the COVID transmission. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Okay. For our final paper, we are um, staying within the Southern Hemisphere, but just barely, just below the equator. Um, and we're going to Rwanda, where um, uh, Man Man Manolio Machiletti will present his uh, paper entitled Emergency Response Design in Housing Typologies in the Post-COVID Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, Dr. Machiletto is a senior lecturer of architecture and the Dean of the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Rwanda in Kigali. He obtained his PhD in architectural composition at the University of Venice, Italy. He has published various papers and book chapters uh, and, and books on archeological, or excuse me, architectural heritage, urban design and tropical architecture. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. I'm delighted to have the chance to present the research called Emergency Responsive Design in Housing Topologies in the Post-COVID Kigali, Rwanda. Why Housing Topologies? Because I do believe that architecture can still play an important role in fighting the spread of COVID or any other epidemic crisis, complying with the measures put in place by the different governments. The aim of the research is not just to compare two different housing types, the twin house and the apartment house during COVID lockdown, but above all, to provide a way forward for the next urban development, identifying one precise housing type that better responded to the emergency, the ongoing emergency, and one possible method to compose this housing type in order to comply also with the adopted master plan guidelines that requires for Kigali to achieve a, a higher urban density. Briefly, uh, the context. The context is the sub-Saharan region. And as you can see from the image on the right side of the, of the, the slide, the continent is facing a rapid urban growth led by Cairo, Lagos, and Kinshasa, the so-called megalopolis. And Kigali, the, the capital city of, uh, of Rwanda, is also experiencing a rapid growth, but located in the East African region. What is interesting uh, uh, for us is also to notice that architecture plays an important role at national and urban level. Why? Because the national government adopted a very specific development plan for the country, as you can see, a polycentric model. The country is structured in six secondary cities uh, around the capital uh, Kigali, and the capital Kigali is divided in three districts, and in each district there is um, a, a different satellite. Uh, also, Kigali as a polycentric structure or a satellite city development plan. Kachuriro is the satellite place on the north side of Kigali and where also the two, the two housing types are located. Kigali over time. In 1910 was just a Germany, German military compound that in 1940 became just a small part of the structure city. And in 1990, before the dramatic event of 94, the genocide is part of a already dense urban structure. And now, as I said before, Kigali is experiencing a rapid urban growth, counting today population of 1.2 million inhabitants. The Gachuriro satellite is composed by three different settlements, Kigali 2020, Kigali Vision, and Kigali Vision 2. The first two settlements are already completed. Kigali Vision 2 is under construction. The Kigali 2020 is designed as a regular sequence of four 
typologies of twin houses along the contours lines of the slope. Kigali vision is characterized by different dwelling types. And for uh, our research, we have just taken into consideration the apartment houses that are here down highlighted in black. Each unit of twin houses has a private outdoor space. Uh, you can see here highlighted in dark green, opposite to the condominium that share a vast common green area. As previously said, also the need of increasing the density push the municipality to privilege these last kind of buildings, the multi-story buildings. But during the three months of lockdown, the measures taken to prevent and stop the spread of the virus confine all the people at home. It's obvious that living in the twin houses that you can see here in this picture has the advantage of continue, continuing a normal domestic life even outside in the outdoor space, so important also related to the local culture and tradition, but was really difficult eh, to be achieved by people confined in the apartment building that were sharing just a small terrace, as you can see on the right side of the slide of this uh, uh, condominium elevation. Twin houses are also more flexible than the apartments. As you can see, they give the chance for the owners to extend, to expand the layout of the, of the house, to add more space in the overall layout of the house, expanding the house footprint and customizing it according to different needs. For instance, having an extra space as office that can be, used, can be utili utilized sorry, for smart working during the, uh, the pandemic epidemic crisis. But the twin house can assure a good life quality during tough lockdowns, but we have to comply, as I said, with the current master plan. And so to adopt this type, I mean, the twin house in the future so, settlement so is necessary to find a way of increasing the Therefore, the research concludes proposing the Peter Behrens concept of group, group and bau weise in order to group in the same area occupied by two houses, houses seven units, and at the same time providing an adequate outdoor private space and an appropriate level of flexibility in changing the house layout. Thank you for those uh, wonderful papers. I have a few comments for the panel as a whole, and then um, a, few, a few questions for each of the individual papers. Uh, first, let me say that I'm very humbled to moderate your work. As a historian of uh, colonial cities in Southeast Asia, I'm used to critiquing uh, the work of architects and urbanists uh, who are long dead. So to actually uh, be in contact with living people is um, a new experience for me. Um, second, as I work on uh, colonial urbanism, I was most struck by questions of political power in your papers. You all have wonderful ideas, um, but how might these agendas be implemented? Perhaps um, you could speak to the political context of each of your cases. I imagine it would be easier for technocrats to implement uh, things in Kagame's uh, somewhat authoritarian Rwanda than in the political chaos of the United States of America right now. And on a related note, I would love to hear about how these projects are sold to the general public in Italy, in Washington, DC, in Argentina, in R Rwanda. How do we get the, the general population um, on board with these programs? For Andrea Aldani, I was wondering if you could say a few words on canals gone wrong. I grew up in Honolulu next to the Alawai Canal. I've lived in Jakarta, Indonesia, and in Phnom Penh, and in uh, Cambodia, and in Hanoi, all cities with once beautiful canals, which um, now are uh, less than desirable and sometimes a public health hazard. Um, what's involved in um, maintaining uh, such um, uh, 
environmental slash urban infrastructure and what needs to, what needs to be done uh, to ensure that these canals don't go wrong. Uh, for Team America, shall we say, I have a very American question. While your proposals for schools as community centers strike me as wonderful and remind me of some of the best aspects of life under socialist rule that I observed in suburban Shanghai and in Hanoi when I was living there, I, I worry about America's ongoing epidemic, not COVID-19, but the epidemic of gun violence. My daughter's public schools here in California have steadily been restricting access to campus. Uh, indeed, we just had a big infrastructure project of building fences and restricting the number of entry points to the campus. Um, how do we reconcile the school as public community center with the safety concerns raised by Columbine, Sandy Hook, and, Park and Parkland, to name just a few of the many tragic cases that we've had to deal with of on-campus violence? Uh, for Maria Sosa and the Argentinians, who are currently enjoying the summer as we freeze in the middle of winter, I'm curious about the use of greenery and, ur and urban maintenance. Uh, my university is in Sacramento, California, once known as the City of Trees. Um, while it is very green and the trees actually have a really ex excellent invisible impact of controlling the, um, the temperature on the street during the hot summers of the Central Valley, um, the trees pose a number of problems. Um, uh, in the winter storms, branches come crashing down um, and impact uh, structures. Uh, as a cyclist, I have had to deal with massive leaf drops blocking the bike lanes in the fall and uh, various safety concerns that uh, arise from that. And um, well, as a sufferer of allergies, um, I don't appreciate all the pollens. Um, these may seem like somewhat uh, petty complaints or cranks, but they do have an overall impact on the, um, the lived experience of the city. And I also um, think that's maybe sort of tied in to my question about how to enroll the public in this project. I'm also wondering if you could speak more to the issue of trying to retrofit urban centers with your designs for street and block orientation. Um, the, uh, and uh, what would be involved in that in, um, again, retrofitting uh, the city. Uh, for Dr. Micheletto, um, I was wondering if you could say a few words on the difference between tropical architecture and non-tropical architecture. Um, and uh, wh what's involved specifically in terms of tropical architecture and planning for disease. Um, I, I know that uh, Rwanda has uh, done exceptionally well in the face of the current pandemic, sort of ranks up there with Vietnam as success stories. And um, is any of the urban planning uh, that you've discussed related to these, um, to these, uh, to the success? Again, I really enjoyed these papers. I love the optimism that they embody uh, to make our cities better, more functional and healthier and more inclusive spaces after uh, uh, we get through COVID. So please don't take my uh, critique as pessimism or negativity. So um, if the presenters would unmute themselves and uh, turn on their, um, their cameras, we'd love to hear from you. And then I'll take some questions from the Q&A. Can I start answering? Do you listen to me? I'm Andrea Oldani from Italy. So uh, your question is about uh, this canal. Is This canal is a little different than historical canals all over the world because it's very recent. Uh, they started building this canal in uh, 1954, so more or less 70 years ago, and is a very monofunctional. It's a diverse... Uh, is for the diversion of the water uh, exceeding uh, some natural rivers. So uh, it's a very technical infrastructure. And also for this reason, uh, people doesn't have any connection with this uh, canal. Actually, at the moment, this canal is, uh, is basically also a little derelict because they are not doing maintenance mm -hmm. and uh, the river banks are quite uh, difficult to assess and uh, from the formal point of view is forbidden going around the canal because it's belonging to the country 
and uh, is something like a military space. I don't know how to say in a different way. So basically, the engagement of the population is basically like zero. But the the the, poten the, the potential, I think, is related to uh, the connection with important uh, natural areas, uh, reserve of diversity, and uh, uh, the possibility of using this space as a very strong connection between the dense city and the open space. That is something that can also change the idea itself of this uh, infrastructure. It's quite curious also that there is a, uh, some, there are some points where there is an intersection between these uh, very technical infrastructure and the historical waterways that are uh, now uh, very active and uh, livable public spaces because the water condition is very good and people like to spend free time uh, walking or biking along the waterways. This is something a bit different, for example, from what I saw in Bangkok, where sometimes those kind of waterways are very crowded and polluted, but for transportation and movement of goods and yeah, let's say that in Italy now, uh, the touristic use of waterways is something that is quite developed, especially in, around Milan, but the historical one, not the contemporary one. Um, who, who would like to speak next? Um, I can talk to some of your questions about schools, if that's okay. And then uh, I'll pass it to some of my colleagues uh, to, uh, to round out the conversation, perhaps. Um, I think you've raised a couple of really interesting points. You know, one, certainly the political context that we're working within here. I mean, the, the interesting thing to note about American schools, however, is, is quite often decisions are made at uh, you know, municipal or, or local levels you know, versus you know, perhaps some of the uh, challenges we've seen at the federal level here, uh, you know, certainly in, in sitting 13 blocks from the Capitol right now, I've certainly seen uh, that in its many uh, uh, shapes and forms. Um, so I think the, the good news to some extent is these decisions are made in a decentralized manner um, by generally uh, political entities or governmental entities that haven't experienced quite the uh, turmoil that uh, the federal government has over time. That said, the federal government is moving now with the new administration towards uh, an infrastructure bill, uh, potentially, that might actually begin to uh, impact some of the, the conversation that we're having, both about infrastructure uh, affecting health and wellness, but the general uh, state of repair of our schools that uh, could potentially become uh, influential. But your question about safety is, is one that, you know, as an architect, we deal with uh, uh, every day as we're designing schools. Um, and the issue of gun violence and uh, active shooters is, is something that is, is actually uh, one of the first questions that's raised oftentimes by school communities, um, certainly. Uh, and part of that is, is one of perception that, you know, uh, at least prior to the pandemic, you know, there were a number of events, you know, that put this front and center on everybody's minds. However, we just published a white paper on, on the idea of a, a more holistic view of safety and wellness uh, in schools, which suggests that, that may be front and center on everybody's minds, but actually there are other threats, you know, that uh, we need to be dealing with uh, in schools, you know, that are, are, are you know, have a much greater impact on you know, the general population. And I think that's part of what we're talking about today. Um, and the idea of broadening, you know, the, the reach and the programs delivered by schools uh, in many ways is, is targeted directly at, you know, safety in, in the broadest sense of, and the resilience of our communities, such that you know, we're delivering services for food insecurity or, or um, you know, mental and uh, physical uh, health and well-being you know, that we've uh, seen underscored throughout the population. So there are answers also about how a community can come into a building and, you know, you don't have to allow necessarily access, you know, throughout the entirety of the building. It's, you know, just sort of good organization and appropriate entrances and appropriate supervision uh, of that. So there are certainly architectural solutions to that. But, but Bruce, um, 
curious if you have thoughts about again this this larger idea of safety you know uh, that we're positing you know through this community school idea yeah i'll just quickly add to what sean said and that is um we're working with a group called safe and sound schools and uh they have a lot of strategies that are relevant to this i think sean just hit it on the nail when he talked about the fact that the access issues can be addressed in ways that don't allow general access to all the different stakeholder groups that need to and should be using the schools. So I think that is something that's addressable. And the other point I would just add to your very, to respond to your very good questions, Michael, were that at the national level, I think we are going to see the US Department of Education have a lot more interest in pushing the idea of community schools mm -hmm. to the localities, which Sean correctly pointed out are the are really the focal points. But what we're also seeing as, as recently as this morning, I got a uh, email from a group that is pushing localities to learn how to use some of the COVID funding money to build out their community school functions in their schools. So it's, it's, it's penetrating down to the local levels as well. I think the viability is there. Rebecca, do you have a comment? I think they summarized that point really well, but um, happy to add on to other questions and let other people speak at this time. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Machiletto. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for the interesting question. I see that the network is not really stable at the moment. Anyway, uh, let me start from this dangerous uh, question related to politics. So architecture, <laughs> architecture cannot be disconnected from uh, politics. I don't know the contrary. Sometimes politics uh, is um, uh, taking decision without consulting um, architecture or the architects or the urban planner. What is int uh, interesting in the case of Rwanda is um, the inclusivity, uh, not only from our side, the academia, uh, as you can see behind me, our school of architecture, our brand new school, uh, of course, also the, the public and private sector and the, the inhabitants, the, the, the people that live uh, Kigali, the Rwandans uh, or the Kigalians. Um, and so sure, a, a highlighted uh, power or politics can, can lead in a uh, good manner, uh, the development of the city, not only shaping the city through a master plan that unfortunately is uh, reduced just to to a technical uh, tool, unfortunately. Uh, we are no more uh, too cool and this is, uh, uh, not really interesting. Um, and then uh, going back also to your question about tropic architecture. Um, I spent the last 10 years in Central Africa and it has become um, my main uh, topic for my uh, is true. Uh, in Ghana, we try and do from uh, England develop uh, for healthy issues uh, in Africa. And so, sure, sure, when we apply the principles uh, or the the details of the tropic architecture, we may respect and we we may comply with some healthy. Uh, uh, issues that are um, here in uh, in the tropical uh, region. Uh, the the the, research, the paper that I presented research presented uh, try also to raise this uh, problem of forgetting 
uh, with the new project, um, the, 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 the basic uh, uh, principle of tropical architecture, the distances between buildings, the cross ventilation, the orientation of the buildings, uh, to um, uh, comply also with the, um, the site, uh, so the analysis, topographic analysis, and so on. Uh, and for example, these are all uh, items that are all topics that we try to um, develop during the architectural studios with the students. Um, the next generations of architects uh, in, in Rwanda. Um, so that's all. Maybe if you have other questions. I... Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have a question from the Q&A. Uh, actually, a, a keeping with the international uh, nature of this event, a question from Israel uh, that asks, um, what, what do speakers of the conference think about the possibility to use the creative opportunity of building more social and cheap housing solutions and for the max, uh, maximal um, reuse of, or repurposing of commercial real estate? Um, and uh, the the questioner uh, notes that this, the pandemic presents an opportunity to invest in um, uh, the redevelopment of quality and effective public transport as well. So I guess this is a question towards the, the larger social possibilities presented by the, uh, the current pandemic. Um, I can maybe start. Uh, I think I think what's interesting is that, I mean, as we kind of elucidated in our presentation, everything that's happened has really underpinned issues that were already existing for a long period of time. And it's really allowed us to think about our spaces and kind of everything. It's almost, um, I'm sure like many people who have watched The Crown recently, <laughs> just getting um, into Winston Churchill again, but one of his, I think, amazing quotes is never waste a crisis. And I think mm -hmm. from that, um, I think there's a lot we can learn and especially about our environments. You know, with schools, schools is one part of it, but our work environments, our residential sphere, everything is sort of, as we were articulating is super interconnected. And I think it's allowed us to really see the domino effect with all our spaces as well. Um, so I think with that in mind, you know, if, you know, if remote work is here to stay, let's say what happens to this, that sphere of architecture um, within a, all these office buildings, do they get Reserviced to serve other different needs and programmatic needs. Um, there's also been a, a housing crisis for a long period of time. Do we also reevaluate our cities and infrastructure that's already been existing to really serve different needs um, accordingly as well? So, mm -hmm. I guess to to answer the question, I feel, especially I think coming from the uh, the point of view of an architect, I think it's extremely interesting to examine all the major shifts that I think will occur um, of all of our spaces to base, to accommodate kind of the shifting nature of everything that's happening to date, but also the shifting nature of um, the, that we're seeing the needs of our community as well. We've got a question um, from a YouTuber. Um, <laughs> how do the presenters feel about hybrid indoor outdoor environments? Um, and especially in the, as we're in this airborne pandemic, um, how uh, do they work as a way to manage uh, air airflow in a sort of a, a passive manner? I think it's a quite interesting and very complex question. I mean, I had one question also. There was also another question that I answered in the chat, uh, going in the same direction, saying, but why thinking the use uh, of some places as, as uh, public spaces in time of uh, 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 crisis like this one with problems of density and uh, uh, avoiding uh, distancing, no, avoiding uh, um, groups of people doing the same the same things in the same place. I think the problem of open air is something that, I mean, in the last years we lost uh, the ability of recognizing the importance of open air spaces. Uh, 
uh, going uh, some time to spend our free time in um, shopping malls, gyms, and so on. For example, now something that here in Italy we are rediscovering is also the opportunity of doing some uh, gym ex exercises inside of open public spaces. So mm -hmm. some municipalities are trying to find some areas where to do gym, yoga, or other kind of activities because uh, it's much more easy to solve uh, some uh, problems uh, in this kind of uh, wide environments than inside of uh, closed spaces. So for the same reason, I think in the future, there will be new kind of architectural typologies where the role of open spaces will, will be much more important. I'm thinking to, for example, open air classes for the schools, but also open air gyms and uh, for example open air uh, ways of doing shopping like it was before the era of commercial mall let's say mm -hmm. but this is a little of personal opinion and i think now is too early for uh, having a clear idea about what is going to happen because the situation is still going on and uh, the complexity is increasing day by day and our reaction is something that we cannot totally control. I mean, it's really something that that is going on. Yeah, and the, the, the open air hybrid uh, space is really geographically dependent too. Um, the possibilities in um, very temperate high altitude yeah. uh, Kigali is going to be dramatically different than Washington DC, which alternates based up on my limited exposure between sweltering and, and freezing. Um, yeah. um, perhaps the, um, uh, the American team could say a few words on possibilities uh, or indoor outdoor uses. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. And I would agree with you know, some of the comments that it's, it's a complex you know, answer in many ways. And, and to your point that it, it depends on your location. However, there's actually a rich history of open air schools, you know, in response to tuberculosis early in the 20th century um, and renewed interest on, you know, some of the architecture of um, you know, Doiker's, you know, a fabulous open air school in, in the Netherlands or Neutra's, you know, open air schools in California. Um, so this idea of, you know, uh, blurry boundaries between inside and out has been explored you know, in the modern movement, you know, but certainly we have much greater abilities to assess the performance of our buildings and the performance of the environment um, and think about, you know, the integration of, you know, uh, passive ventilation and, and other uh, aspects of this question. Um, that said, I think one of the positives coming out of uh, the crisis is that even before the crisis, you know, many of our buildings were sealed up tight. You know, there were no operable windows. Uh, it's, it was considered a, a detriment to the performance of the mechanical systems. And now we're realizing that operable windows, you know, have an incredible value in some situations, you know, to, to help uh, enhance the ventilation in the environment. But that said, you know, because we do work uh, in a lot of locations, you know, nationally and internationally, there are some urban settings where, frankly, the the outdoor air is is you know uh, so polluted that you know, it, it's it's unhealthy in many ways uh, to to either bring into the building or in some situations even for the children to go out and into the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a contextual issue. It's based on climate, you know, culture, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the environment and the, the uh, environmental controls, you know, on uh, auto vehicles and other emissions, you know, that all becomes a very sort of complex calculus to answer your question, you know, so. Right, and, and as, as you mentioned in regards to um, urban pollution, where, where sites are situated within the city and issues around zoning and so forth. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, it's a question that I, I need to plead ignorance about a specific term, but the um, Elisa Rice asks, how do you feel about 15 minute cities becoming more common in the US after the pandemic? I, I don't know what a 15 minute city is. Um, this is a, a term widely used. Maybe it's a, a, a reference to urban revisioning in terms of being able to get to every part of the city within 15 minutes? 
I'm assuming that's in reference to walkability, but I could be mistaken if that's the question. I hope that this <laughs> is. I think unusual. I think it's about walkability. It's something that I heard also in Europe, but since the question is about US, uh, better answering someone from the yeah, US. <laughs> I think I think there will be. Um, I think similarly to uh, everything that's happening, just a heightened awareness of our surrounding communities and what's there, um, especially now if you're with kind of in a block radius and if you don't have a grocery store, if you don't have a school nearby, it's sort of really heightening kind of the needs of your everyday life to be in a, a small radius, I think, if it is such an emphasis on walkability. I think also what's interesting now with as people are being more inwards, they're more focused on who their neighbors are, what's in the surrounding, are they able to kind of have everything they need in a short distance, and less reliability, I would say, on other forms of transit from car to this, um, from train, plane, what have you. And I think with that, um, there'll be a an increased focus on what makes, I think, an idealized community as opposed to saying there's maybe four major centers within a city and I think more kind of a more hub and spoke model that there'll be more kind of micro um, amenities within all of our communities and maybe going to a larger hub. Uh, so I would say, yes, I, I think there will be a, a much larger transition. And I think that's that was already in the works, I think, for a long time um, within the United States, but also uh, in other parts of the world as well. Okay, Th thank you, Rebecca. Um, don't mean to cut you off, but we're, yeah, no, we're out of time. And I, I, I love ending this session on an optimistic note for a better city. So uh, thank you to the presenters so much. Thank you to the attendees and thank you to the organizers, Caitlin and Mohammed. I pass the microphone back to Mohammed.